Please be seated. Um, so, a couple of words about my friend Tony. Tony was a member of the parish that I was rector at in Acton, St. Albans, along with her son, Albie, uh, Ed, her husband, and a mum and dad here, uh, Pam and Jim, who uh, I still get together with occasionally and uh, I count amongst a couple of my best friends ever. Um, Tony uh, uh, is First Nations, for, uh, in, Indigenous, and she'll tell us all about that. Uh, when I left St Albans, Tony held a smudging ceremony for me, and I was smudged on my last day at St Albans. And she gave me my own... Uh, I'll forget what's that about <laughs> She gave me this. <laughs> she gave me my own smudging kit, and I've got my own feather in here, and all the, all the things I need for smudging. And uh, she made this entire kit up for me, which I really treasure. Uh, it's a handmade uh, artifact, and uh, it means a great deal to me. So, all of you folks who are watching at home and all of you here today. I suspect that it might be easier uh, if Tony does what she did at 8.30, she asks if anybody has any questions, in which case it might be easier if the choir was to come forward into these seats so it'd be easier to have a two-way exchange and conversation. Okay, so with that, I'd like to invite Tony to come forward, please, and uh, introduce herself. I think so. That sounds good. <laughs> um, Ulaku, good morning, Tungasagi, welcome. Um, it's an honor to be able to come and share uh, who I am as an Inuk. Uh, my son and I are Inuit from Nunavik, Northern Quebec. Um, I was um, came to be in this area as part of the 60s group. Uh, you may have known about the 60s scoop. Um, if you've heard Murray Sinclair speak about uh, the residential schools, he also talks about the 60s scoop as being the federal government not wanting that responsibility to continue to apprehend Indigenous babies and children. All First Nations, all Inuit and Métis were affected by, as we know, the residential schools, which then became the 60 scoop. So the responsibility was passed to the provinces whereby Children's Aid Society in Ontario and other child protection services across the country were declared to apprehend babies and children. Uh, the federal government also didn't want to continue to pay for those federal and uh, residential schools, uh, so it was passed to the provinces. So I am a 60 scoop baby. I'm going to speak a little bit about my truth, my family's truth. I'm also going to share a little bit about Inuit history, because for Inuit in Canada, the timelines are a little bit different, and the events and history uh, really, it has been most impactful only in the last 80 years, uh, whereas other nations have had a couple hundred or hundreds of years of assimilation and attempted genocide and colonization. And we're also in a time where we can come together to talk openly about the truth. And I believe that there cannot be reconciliation until the truth is heard. Until the truth is heard um, from indigenous peoples in our own ways and in our accurate truth. Well, growing up here um, north of Milton, uh, if you know Speyside at all, um, my mom and dad are here, Pam and Jim, whom I love very much, and um, that's where I grew up. But in school, there was not any accurate indigenous truth taught in schools. Indigenous peoples are trying to work with the Ministry of Education today to correct that. There's still a long ways to go. Um, but we are in a day um, 
I could not have spoken like this maybe five years ago, 10 years ago, definitely not 20 years ago, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. That's how oppressed it was, and that's how oppressed it was for Inuit and Indigenous peoples. I'd like to point out my mother, Nelly Humaluk, my birth mother. She's from Inukshuak on the Hudson Bay in Nunavik, Northern Quebec. And my birth father was Itoa Inuluk Takayapik, who's now passed away. He came from Khoaktak, which is on the Ngava coast of Nunavik, Northern Quebec, below Baffin Island. My mother is a very strong survivor. She was born on the land, as was my father. Born without buildings like this, born without hydro, born without a clock, born without a 12-month calendar as we know it, born on the land and lived traditionally on the land for the early parts of their life. My mother is now 80 and she has started to talk about some of our truth for our family. And she recalls the days where she would um, travel on the land with her father by dog team. Um, she, because she's the oldest sibling and the oldest girl, she was taught how to hunt and fish in the event that uh, when the men were away and did not make it back to the camp, then there needed to be a woman that knew how to hunt. So my mother was taught how to hunt and fish. Um, she is a, an extremely um, very good at uh, following the weather. She'll know the moment she goes outside what it's going to be like and what it's going to do for that survival on the land. She grew up not knowing um, going to the store to buy the clothing like we're wearing today. Food was hunted traditionally rather than uh, being bought in a store. Inuit have always been nomadic since time immemorial, tra uh, traveling, following the herds, following the caribou, the muskox, being on the water, following the seals, the whales, and the fish. Inuit, we also have our own creation stories. We believe in a creator. There are different creation stories depending on where you come from. And in our region, for my son and I, um, Inukshuak means the giant. And Inuit in our home community, we believe in the giants and the semi-giants. So our ancestors, since time immemorial, have been passing down Inuit traditional knowledge through storytelling. Inuit Kayuma Yatukangi, Inuit ways of being, what Inuit have always known to be true, our beliefs, our societal values. In the last 80 years, it's been most impactful for um, Inuit being taken off the land, take the Eskimo out of the Eskimo. Um, history in Canada for all Indigenous people we know has left legacies. Uh, Inuit did go to residential schools. Um, there was a federal day school in Inukshuak, uh, my mother's community that my aunt went to. Um, there was also different points for Inuit that um, are maybe not as known down here. We had the dog slaughter, whereby the Canadian government in Ottawa decided to have the RCMP, the church officials, and the Hudson Bay outpost staff order Inuit for the mass slaughter of all husky dogs. This was to assimilate this was to take away nomadic way of living. This was to take the Eskimo out of the Eskimo. My father remembers very vividly before he passed away the days of the dog slaughter. There have always been a profound relationship between Enoch man and the dog team. There was also the hierarchic relocation, whereby again in Ottawa, the government decided to take Inuit, <coughs> excuse me, from Inukshuak, which is my mother's home community, to the high Arctic. This was to keep land in Canada, and Inuit became flagpoles for the Canadian government, forcing Inuit to get on that ship and go to what you see on the map today as Resolute Bay 
and Greece Fjord at the top of the world. So again, another government initiation. Eskimo disc numbers, where Inuit naming system confused the government so much, and traditionally Inuit have never had surnames up until that point, being identified only by a number, very dehumanizing. I would have had an Eskimo disc number had I been in that era, or having stayed with my mother. Um, all Inuit remember their disc numbers. There were the Eskimo, experimental Eskimos, where the government removed three young men and used them as lab rats in Ottawa. Instead of traveling to the north to be with Inuit, they took three young men. There was also um, tuberculosis sanatoria. There's a, a very big one in Hamilton that if you go to the Royal Botanical Gardens, you will see the grave site, the memorial for all Inuit that died here. So our history is fresh. So reconciliation is fresh. Intergenerational trauma is still real. My mother, who has survived many things, the dog slaughter, having family go to residential school, the high arctic relocation where my grandfather hid our family inland. For her, the biggest was having me taken away the day I was born. I was apprehended in Ontario. She was flown down here knowing that I would be taken away uh, by child welfare. So it's very much very fresh for her. I've had two birthdays with her, the day I was born and apprehended, and a few years ago when I turned 50, she was here and we held each other, we cried. We still have moments of confusion and anger and sadness. Over 30 years ago now, we've also built love and happiness. And it's starting to come more full circle. For my mom, Pam and Jim, um, I have always been given the opportunity to know who I am and where I come from. And that is a true gift um, the violence I endured was not in the home, it was in the community. Um, and when we met my birth mom for the first time, uh, mom and dad came with me to Winnipeg. Uh, so it is um, building its own relationship. Um, a lot of love, a lot more of an understanding. And for our son, who is so proud to be Inuk, He's able to continue that rite of passage that was broken when I was apprehended. And I've continued my own rite of passage, as has Ananaga, my mom. So we are in a day where we talk about the truth, and we all have a truth. All people have a truth. For Indigenous peoples, it is, uh, for Indigenous History Month in June, is also hard sometimes. Uh, because it was in 2021 that 215 unmarked graves were discovered at a residential school in British Columbia. That was from Page News then. It has fallen to the wayside, which is very disheartening because it's still continuing across the country. We know, LP and I know, my son, that they have now begun surveying the land in Nunavik, northern Quebec which means that we will have family, likely, that will be unearthed. So it's a time for all of us that we need to reflect and heal together and be together. June 21st was National Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, it's not really a holiday. Uh, it's a day where we can be together and celebrate who we are in safe places, uh, with drum dance, with drumming, with song, um, good food, celebration, sharing our stories, and we welcome all people. Inuit, the word itself means all living people. We are being Inuit together today. And this is what reconciliation is about. It's for all people and all people's healing, not just indigenous peoples. I really am thankful. A few years ago, um, Brian, you had invited me to um, the Anglican Church in Milton, uh, where there was an apology offered from the Anglican Church for the residential schools. 
And that is the type of action and reconciliation that we must continue on a regular basis. September 30th is also a landmark day now for those 215 unmarked graves. It's every child matter days. So take those chances. Take the day off work. I, I, I don't care if I'm granted it off or not. I'm going to take that day off to be with my people, to be with each other when we share that pain and that love for those unmarked graves. When my son was born, Children's Aid Society showed up for him because I'm in their system. It took everything for my husband to hold me down so I didn't start throwing punches. And I was asked a question in the earlier service, can I forgive or do I forgive? I do have forgiveness. I do forgive my mother Nellie and my father Itoa Inoluk. I was angry at them. I didn't know their truth. I forgive them for the anger and their pain that has become intergenerational because it still continues. I forgive Pam and Jim for not knowing as well, and especially when the announcement came out from the federal government about the 60 scoop. I forgive you for not knowing. I didn't know you didn't know. I forgive government, and again, I will say that loosely, I still get angry at the government. There has not been a federal apology for the 60 scoop. I would certainly expect that in my birth mother's lifetime. She deserves an apology. She deserves the government to tell her directly, I'm sorry, because she did not have other children for fear that they'd be taken away too. They took her right away to be a mother. So how do I forgive that? I have to let it go. I can't carry all of it all the time like I used to. And I do forgive, and I am telling my truth. I do take it back because I'm still angry. So for Inuit, I can only speak as an Inuk. Um, there are churches up north. Um, Inuits may have varying thoughts about church because it was the churches that were taking Inuit away for residential schools. Um, my grandfather became one of the first Inuit ministers for the Anglican Church on the Hudson Bay. Uh, so my family and my mother are uh, very uh, devout in the Anglican religion. But it's a contrast of worlds. Only 80 years ago, being on that land, being traditional, not having a church or knowing the Bible or the words, to now following only 80 years, that's not a long time. So it's about coming together as all people. We are all people as one, and we walk in a way that we can teach others, teach the knowledge that we have, show the way of kindness, put that action together about reconciliation because it is about every single day and not just in the month of June or in the month of September. And I have really enjoyed my time coming down here. Um, I've had some really great conversations after the 8 o'clock or 8.30 service, and I welcome any questions. And I know I'm trying not to take up a lot of time, Brian. You're going to have to be my time management. <laughs> Are there any questions? Don't be shy. It's okay.
Yeah, and that's a very good question. Um, just thinking about land acknowledgements. Um, land acknowledgements are a way to um, acknowledge traditional lands. There are um, land acknowledgements where there's treaty recognition, uh, like it was in today's. Um, really, it's not something that needs to be scripted. It's um, coming from the heart as a, an Indigenous person. What do I appreciate about the land and the water? For Inuit, it's land, water, and ice, Inuit, Nunenga, and what we get from the land and what we give back. Um, but a small example, um, in the rain in the last couple days, uh, we heard the tree frogs. I love the sound of the tree frogs. We also had the woodpeckers that come around um, and are just, I can hear the pileated woodpeckers, the big ones in the woods. And I saw two rainbows after the thunderstorms. So it's paying attention to the land in a way where I'm not um, being contrived. Uh, I'm just, what's my environment? How do I love the environment? And it's um, blue sky now, uh, which is nice. I appreciated the thunderstorms. We needed those. It was a good clearing of the air. So yes, there are scripts, and a, a script may be a good way to understand the maybe the background of a land acknowledgement, um, but if I ever do one, then it's coming from my heart because I want to show my own appreciation and thanks for what I'm given, if that makes sense. Yes. How were you able to find your birth mother? And it, it's so nice that your parents allowed you that freedom to, to search it out, to search her out, because I know so often that's not the case. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was in my early 20s, and this is over 30 years ago, where I finally had a nag about where I come from. That pull to find out who my parents are and where I come from. Um, I was angry and scared as a young person, but I finally reached that point I wanted to know. And the federal government at the time, all the adoption files were closed. It was at a time nobody could access anything. Uh, so mom had reached out to the Inuit Tapiri, uh, of Ca uh, Tapir side of Canada. Um, it's now uh, Inuit uh, Tapiri Kanatami. Uh, but it was Jack Anawak that, um, and Inuk, at ITC that was able to point in the right direction because Inuit are all connected. Everybody knows everybody. And even with the wrong name on my birth certificate of my mother, um, Inuit at Inuit de Pierce out of Canada found her very quickly. And we went to Winnipeg. Yeah, um, the 60 scoop, uh, the federal government defines as 1955 to 1995, and Indigenous peoples know for a fact um, that babies and children were being apprehended before 1955, um, well beyond 1995 to the what became the millennial scoop. And even today, there's an over-representation of Indigenous children in child welfare. So it hasn't stopped. Um, Social services, doctors, um, or professionals would decide during the 60 scoop if um, a mother was single or parents weren't together. Um, if a parent had health issues, it was decided that their child would be taken or their children. Um, if um, parents were poor, uh, which was my mother, she was single. She had uh, visual limitations, being blind for a lot of her life. Uh, she wasn't working, and so they decided for her. Um, indigenous peoples have known since time immemorial how to have babies and raise children. And it was through the 60 scoop that our right was taken away. 
So there were many reasons why parents uh, were told or forced to have their child or baby apprehended. And you can ask um, my son and I questions afterwards as well, or you can certainly approach me if, uh, if you don't wish to speak now. But Nakomi Magyalok, thank you very much for allowing me into this space. Quite a few of you know that um, uh, two weeks ago uh, there was a clerk.